Thank you for being interested in regenerative medicine. We want to thank the ASICU for finding a place for us when our usual venue on the terrace was taken by another event. Uh, we'd also like to thank our sponsor for this, Cross Insurance. Tonight's a very exciting event for us because on the other side of the island at the MDI Biological Laboratory, we've just, we are just in the process of finishing a first time two week course in regenerative medicine that has brought scientists and some students from all over the world to study regenerative medicine here. And in the midst of this course, we held a symposium last weekend and had another hundred or so scientists and students join us, and some of them are here tonight. And as part of this, we also held uh, six public lectures, and I recognize some of you attended some of these lectures. So tonight, which is really the culmination of this course, which ends tomorrow, I believe, we have two directors from the course, Drs. Butt Yin and Ken Poss, who are here tonight. And I just want to acknowledge the fact that this course was Butt's brainchild, that he put this idea together. And we believe it's the first of its kind to bring people together to discuss regenerative medicine this way. So I'm just going to turn it over to Butt to introduce Ken and to um, introduce you to their subject. Thank you. Welcome everybody tonight. Um, I'm excited to talk a little bit about regeneration, but mainly to introduce our speaker, Dr. Ken Foss. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about, about Ken. Um, I know Ken quite well from my days as a postdoctoral fellow in his lab when he was actually just starting his lab. Now Ken did his uh, PhD work at MIT, and he later went on to do his postdoctoral work at initially at the University of Utah before the lab relocated to Children's Hospital at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And it was there that Ken really discovered the power of the zebrafish as a model system to interrogate regenerative biology. And I think the theme that you're gonna hear tonight is evolution is a heck of a lot smarter than all of us. <laughs> okay? So, what Ken's work is going to show is that there's no need to reinvent the wheel, especially when there are model systems in nature that have perfected the art of tissue regeneration. So, Ken is currently a professor at Duke Medical Center. He is also a Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator. And for those of you who aren't familiar with HHMI, it is an organization that recognizes both the vision and the caliber of the research program and the scientists running those research programs. So it's a tremendous honor to be recognized in that same light. So what I want to encourage everybody to do is to ask questions, interrupt Ken, and have this be a, a great conversation and dialogue with Ken and all of you. And I'll leave you with this one thought before Ken comes up here, and that is, what is regeneration? How would each of you define tissue regeneration? And that's a question that Ken is going to, to answer, and then you may agree, you may disagree, but it'd be a great point of, of discussion. So without further ado, I, wanna I want you guys to join me in welcoming Dr. Ken Foss. discussion about science, but really this is, if I give maybe 15 to 20 formal seminars a year, this is probably my biggest audience. <laughs> <laughs> so, that says something about the material. But um, um, I, hope, I hope you see it as casual and, and interrupt and ask questions. And this is going to go in a direction I, I don't usually take it. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll, see, we'll see how it goes, but it will be a, a, an important part of it. Um, uh, but gave a, a bit of an icebreaker. Uh, I've been coming here to um, to um, Mount Desert Island for about six years, collaborating with Butt and others on questions in tissue regeneration. And um, I, I think it's true many people in the field have different definitions of what tissue regeneration is or what regeneration is. 
And so we'll start off with this simple slide. Um, we, we can define it as when body parts that have been damaged severely or lost are replaced through, through natural processes, uh, restoring the tissue mass and, and the function of that tissue. Very, very um, simple definitions. There, there are two types we recognize. One is the fact that we're regenerating uh, each and every day. We're losing cells, millions or billions of cells. Uh, everywhere, all of our tissues, uh, and um, we're replacing these in some tissues. You may know regenerate uh, and turn over very quickly, like our intestinal lining, our skin, our, our blood, which where the blood cells turn over about every four months. And then there are slower cells, slower regenerative processes, like in our heart. We have cardiac muscle cells that are with us from the day we're born to the day we die. So really, literally a hundred year old. Uh, heart muscle cells contracting every minute, second of, of the day. And then there's regeneration that's uh, a response to injury. And I'll show you some examples of, of models, but you can imagine lost limbs in salamanders. It's a classic model for uh, a very spectacular regeneration of a complex structure. Uh, like a limb, but also our livers regenerate particularly well. And you can lose up to, say, two-thirds of your liver, which is, is what can happen in a live liver transplant, and that will regenerate within a, a, a short period of time, say, uh, days to weeks. Excuse me, does this include regenerating something outside the body? Could you take cells and put them in a beaker and regenerate something? Would that be...? Yeah, so the, the field of regenerative medicine uh, is... Um, uh, is flexible with definitions, and so many people who study regeneration uh, think about it as um, uh, recon more of reconstitution, so making tissues or um, amplifying stem cells or specific cell types and adding them back in to the injury site. That's, that's part of regenerative medicine, and it's, 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 um, it's, I think it's just semantics whether you, you, you call it regeneration or not. What, what I'll be referring to more so is what I think is the holy grail of regenerative medicine, and that is not adding back cells or, or producing something in a laboratory, a structure, and then attaching it, but um, actually stimulating endogenous processes. I think this is how everyone thinks uh, regeneration should occur, adding factors, uh, stimulating or enhancing a, a natural process, and then, and then re regrowing, a, a, a regrowing tissue that way. Um, and so I want to show you some of the examples briefly of, um, of what kind of regeneration happens in the animal system that uh, we study uh, in the Butts lab studies and, and other labs, at, uh, MDI bio labs and hundreds of labs uh, around the world. And that is the ability to regenerate structures that we, we, we simply can't regenerate. And um, I'm the numbers on spinal cord injury in humans, I, I think in this country, maybe, uh, maybe tens of thousands per year. The spinal cord injury uh, for us, a crush or severing, is, is obviously a very severe, irreversible type of injury. In zebrafish, here are examples, I don't know if you can see, sorry if I'm blocking, of animals that have undergone you know, approved, um, but very severe injuries that fully transect the, the spinal cord, so cut uh, right through the spinal cord in the adult animal. You can see here the effect it has on these animals. They're paralyzed uh, from uh, about two thirds of their uh, two thirds of their their body. But the good news, and why we do these experiments, is that within about six weeks, these are the very very same fish. They're not um, uh, they're not simply using their pectoral fins, which I'll talk about more at the end, to, to make short bursts from the bottom of the tank, but they can swim perfectly normally. So what, what they do in a period of weeks is um, they have the ability to form a bridge between two completely severed spinal cord pieces uh, and grow axons across, grow new nerves across, and not only anatomically reconnect and restore and regenerate, but also function, as you can see here, very same fish, functionally re regenerate um, those, uh, those connections. And this is, I, I think, a, 
of one of, one of the most impressive types of regeneration. We know very little about it. In my lab, we're, uh, we have uh, one or two people now studying this and looking for factors that are released, so molecules that are released upon injury, and that lead to building of a bridge and regeneration of those neurons. But there's, in fact, uh, very few labs in the country and in the world who, who study this, who study a model system that can regenerate the spinal cord really well to understand uh, how they do it. So this, I think, is an untapped uh, area. Yeah, um, how yes? How many different cell types have to uh, regenerate to give you something like that? It seems extremely complex. It is. The spinal cord is particularly complex. And um, in, in this case, you've got um, the, um, the, the support cells, so glial cells, which um, are um, essentially support cells for the, the nerves themselves. They, they don't, they don't um, uh, uh, transmit signals themselves. You've got, um, you've got a, um, uh, a central canal that's lined with a, an epithelial layer that's thought to have stem cells that can produce new neurons, uh, including in inhibitory neurons. And then you've got these long axons that are connecting uh, from the, um, uh, the Russell region, from, from the anterior to the posterior, the head to the, to the tail for those functions. So it's, it's especially complex. And it's not easy to figure out. <laughs> but what we're looking for are, are, are molecules that are produced in, the, in abundance upon injury uh, in the zebrafish. And the idea, the basic idea, is that although it's, it's more complex than this, in the context of a mammalian spinal cord injury, which won't regenerate, we, we would suppose that those, those factors aren't there. And so we can kind of filter through our data sets this way. Um, but I think this is a great example um, of uh, how you can use a, a research model that regenerates well. And we can perform many molecular genetic techniques that I'll, I'll show you some of. Um, oh, there's one more question. I have a question about the specialized cell structures. If, if they're being severed, how do they know how they attach themselves, so to speak? How do they rewire themselves? Is that to, to get functional connected. Yeah, I, I don't know. So how, how, do, they, how do they restore, um, even once they do it anatomically, how do they re restore? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's, um, it's, 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 it's incredible. Um, that's all I have to say. <laughs> I'll show you a simple structure. And a simpler structure, and, and no offense to the cardiologists. <laughs> But heart regeneration is, is something that um, we've studied for ma many years now. And this is something a zebrafish does as well as any, any animal we know of. And so here's just a cartoon movie made several years ago to show you the zebrafish heart, which is simpler than ours. It's fish hearts, they have how many chambers? Do you know? Two. Yes, two. Two. <laughs> two chambers. We have four. They've got an atrium and a ventricle. Um, the main goal of this ventricle is to pump blood to the gills where it's oxygenated. Um, but we have devised several injury models like this to study regeneration. And these clot up beautifully uh, after that. So, uh, and this will, this will go further. But that gives you the idea uh, of the injury models. And we have many other injury models, including uh, heart attack injury models. And, and uh, when we talk about frequencies of heart attacks in this country, it's, it's more on the order of a million a year. So cardiovascular disease is uh, the, 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 main, the main killer in this country. And um, uh, there are about, say, five to six million people with heart failure. So what, um, what is, um, when you think about regenerative medicine, many people uh, would argue that the heart needs it as, as, as much as any tissue. And in zebrafish, after you resect heart muscle, they have uh, another spectacular response, and that is, these are histologic sections. I'm not sure how, um, they're tissue sections. I'm not sure how um, often people look at these, uh, or, but uh, this is, these are as simple as I think you can get. You cut off 25% from the heart, uh, and within a month or two, that, that tissue is restored. And um, what we've, let's see what I have here. What, what this means in, a, um, in the simplest way is, like I said, with spinal cord, 
there's a model now um, to understand uh, a process that, I should say, doesn't happen in humans. Do it doesn't happen in mammals. Sorry? Do they do, they do, any question, do, do, they do anything special to stop the bleeding? Um, I mean, do they have special clotting factors they, that other mammals don't have? They clot, they clot incredibly quickly. I think part of it has to do with the fact that um, the, the pressure uh, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in this system is much lower. It's, say, three millimeters mercury versus 120. And so that could allow them to clot, and the anatomy as well. But um, they, they may have special clotting factors. They, they, they clot um, an injury right through the lumen of that ventricle in about, um, in about 10 seconds, so especially quickly. And any, man, any mammalian heart would, would bleed out after that injury. I, so I, I should emphasize again that um, the ability to regenerate heart muscle is, is something that's not rare in, in the context of all vertebrate species. Probably most vertebrates do this. Fish, salamanders, uh, I don't believe reptiles have been looked at, but in mammals, in the adult phase, it just, it just doesn't happen or happens at a very minimal level, a level that doesn't uh, uh, provide any, any help for, say, a heart attack victim. And a heart attack victim, instead of, of doing what I, I showed you on that last slide, will um, uh, form instead a, a large scar. That scar will stay there, and the scar is a good thing to repair a heart, but for the function of the heart, uh, it's not as good as heart muscle. And the zebrafish, and, and again, probably many other species, make heart muscle in, instead of a scar. And, and um, that concept, the concept that um, heart regeneration is something that can happen and does happen, is, is important. It's very simple, but it's important. And there have been um, now major funding campaigns. The biggest one in the UK, and this was used through national TV ads maybe two or three years ago, um, saying that. Um, Zebrafish can regenerate heart muscle. We need to study this and, and other related topics uh, if, if we want to have the best perspective on how to heal heart attack injuries. And so this is not a, a, a small thing that uh, I just think I study zebrafish heart regeneration, so it's important. But I think it's, it's the, the idea has, uh, has, has gotten out there. Other questions? So I, um, I decided, so I, I think one goal of this talk was, was to um, just indicate how uh, certain laboratory model systems like the zebrafish can regenerate uh, especially well, and how fields have now developed to study this, and how studying um, uh, processes like regeneration uh, in uh, animals like like these fish can lead to ideas for, um, uh, for, for potential therapies. Now, as researchers, our, that's our ultimate goal. That's what we hope our research can lead to, but it's not gonna happen every day, or every week, or every year, that we're gonna generate a therapy. And so, I uh, often give talks that, um, uh, uh, describe this strength of the system and, and this reason why we do it. But I also want to say that um, regeneration research, uh, what, what we do as, as, um, as basic research scientists, as, as discovery biologists, is we want to simply understand how it happens. And we think by, uh, by studying it uh, and understanding the cells and the molecules that are involved, no matter what we find and no matter where it leads us, uh, it's going to be important, it's going to have some impact. And we know already that heart regeneration in fish has had some impact on the larger field of cardiac repair. For instance, it's told us what cells we should be looking at, and in some, case, some cases, what factors we should be looking at. But I also wanted to describe um, a couple of stories that are, that are very basic and discovery-based, and they, they get at questions we didn't know and that are important but might not relate to therapies. And I was hoping I could go toward that angle because that's what really drives me. And my, my biggest hope is that what we discover can be taken up by translational uh, scientists, by cardiologists, uh, and uh, by uh, geneticists, medical geneticists, and, and 
applied for therapies. But for me, I just love doing the science and the people in my lab. So I was hoping I could go through a couple of stories like this. And so in addition to not knowing well how regeneration happens and the parts of understanding it, and it being, I think, one of the most open questions uh, in biology, how and why does regeneration occur, we know very little about other processes of tissue growth that have many commonalities with regeneration after an injury. For instance, in a zebrafish here, we know that within about three months it grows, and this, this is approximately the scale, it grows from an embryo. I don't know if, 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 if any of you have seen uh, fish fry after uh, fertilization and the very rapid development they can undergo in two days. I know this is just a dot on the screen for many of you. But these animals undergo dramatic changes. They form a swimming larva in about a week. They metamorphosize. They go through major changes into a juvenile animal. Uh, and they uh, uh, form an adult animal after about three months. And at this time, as the animal grows, organs grow as well to keep up with function. For instance, the heart needs to maintain the function that uh, uh, makes sense with regard to its, its body size. And um, we, uh, what I want to describe to you is how pursuing a topic in heart regeneration gave some insight into uh, what we now know of how the heart develops and grows as an animal goes from that very early stage to that adult stage and may have uh, 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 and probably does have um, some uh, relevance to how our own how our, our own hearts grow uh, as we grow. So one of the key questions in heart regeneration research was, are stem cells involved? And I think many of you know what stem cells are. And a common definition is that they're these magic cells that can uh, differentiate into any cells in your body. Or, uh, and a more scientific definition is that they, they renew themselves. They make more of themselves. But they can also uh, turn into other cells, um, like uh, we have uh, hematopoietic stem cells and blood stem cells that can make both our red and, and blood uh, uh, red, red and, and white blood types, uh, but then also um, uh, make more of themselves. In the heart, there's been a, a, a controversial uh, uh, a controversy brewing maybe over the last 10 to 15 years about whether using stem cells is the best way to regenerate heart muscle. I'll say right now we don't know how to regenerate human heart muscle. But there's been, I'll conservatively say, hundreds of millions of dollars put into research to uh, try to find stem cells in human hearts or in hearts of any adult mammal, uh, uh, or uh, to use stem cells that aren't normally found in hearts and to direct them to try to make new heart muscle. Again, with the goal of preventing scarring uh, and instead making muscle after a heart attack. In zebrafish, and now uh, in multiple model systems, we now know that the natural process for making heart muscle after an injury is not through the presence and activation of these stem cells and the uh, processes by which these stem cells could turn into contractile beating heart muscle cells, but instead, instead these cells Simply, the ones that are spared by injury, at near that injury site, uh, simply divide and make more of them. But it's a trivial concept, and maybe this is the more boring mechanism. But we now know that natural heart regeneration, the, the, the target cell we need to be interested in, and we need to understand more, is the cardiac muscle cell and its ability to divide. And it's known in mammals, these cells don't divide as, as easily after an injury, and, and generally in the adult form of mammals, and that the environment, the other cell types in this complex environment, although it's, it's a hard and simpler than the spinal cord maybe, um, the, the other cell types in the mammalian heart are, are not as conducive to regeneration. They, they don't provide that, that stimulating environment. And so, the field of heart regeneration, this is what we're mainly looking for in zebrafish, these two things. First, uh, what makes these cells competent to be able to divide after an injury? And then what does 
the injury provide in terms of signals to those cells to, to ask them to divide, or to tell them to divide, or to force them to divide. And we think by finding those two aspects, by studying them, this, this will help us understand mammals more. Um, so what I've mentioned now, this is going to get a little interesting. If you have any questions, uh, you can ask at any point. But one of the, the things we wanted to find out, one of the, the, the questions we wanted to answer as we dig deeper into this question of what makes uh, these cardiomyocytes divide after an injury, what makes them make more, was uh, an idea where we thought there may be these master cardiomyocytes, these cells that are stimulated by injury and uh, have the ability to divide more than their neighbor cell. I forget the name at the time, this was a few years ago, we were suggesting they might be referred to, pioneer cardiomyocytes or master cardiomyocytes, but anyway, ones that control the process. So the idea, and this is common in bio biology and in developmental biology, to look for those cells that uh, may have a, a greater ability to participate in regeneration than others. And to do that, you've got to be able to distinguish these cells in a complex tissue, uh, like an injured heart. And there are ways that uh, you can use genetic technologies and fluorescent proteins that come from, essentially come from jellyfish, that fluoresce when you shine lights on them, different colors, red, yellow, blue, to produce a uh, series of colors in individual cells in a heart. And uh, in this case, by um, a, a, a series of genetic tricks, I'll say, we can produce um, an animal with a heart that has fluorescent colors that are based on the combination of, of, of various uh, colored uh, <coughs> fluorescent proteins, again, coming from jellyfish, such that there's a combinatorial scheme where you can, and here's an example of, of, of examples of, of 10 different um, uh, constructs, each with a, a different set of red, yellow, and, and blue, together combining to give 10 different colors. And that gives that individual cell and its progeny a unique barcode. It stays <laughs> labeled like this, and if it divides, its daughters, its progeny, also get that color. And we can generate animals that have a hundred or more different colors. And this is very state-of-the-art technology that I think is actually best done in zebrafish. It, it's, it seems to work really well in zebrafish. And um, here's an example. And our, here's an example of just looking at the surface of a heart uh, that, uh, um, with, a, with a microscope and shining UV light. And each of these uh, individual colors uh, is an individual cardi heart muscle cell. This is from a 10-day-old embryo. And so we wanted to generate a large uh, heart with a large number of these colors, to give them individual tags, and then look after regeneration to see whether they were uh, colored uh, uh, clusters of cardiomyocytes that expanded much more than, say, the neighbor. It's a classic question in developmental biology. Are there, is there dominance uh, in, in, a, in a process like this? And so what it turned out, though, is that we, I think we learned more uh, about the process of heart development through this approach and how a heart grows as animals grow than, in fact, uh, we ever learned about regeneration from this. I can tell you the answer for regeneration. Are there dominant pioneer or master cardiomyocytes that regenerate more than others? If there are, we would love to find these and study them because we think they could hold the process, uh, hold the key to understanding what makes cardiomyocytes divide so well? But in fact, um, the answer is no. Each cardiomyocyte in the fish heart seems to respond similarly, divide, make this, about the same amount of muscle. And uh, I, I would uh, suggest that in a fish heart, pretty much all cardiomyocytes can respond to injury. And it's, uh, it's probably why they do so well. In the mammalian heart, just uh, uh, to, to finish that thought, we think that in the human heart, mouse heart, dog heart, probably it's a different story. Probably there are very few cardiomyocytes that have the ability to divide upon injury and such that it's insignificant 
for a, a kind of the setting of a heart attack. Um, and our goal is to, to try to, or the goal of the field is to try to find those. But what we found when we were studying heart development was really interesting. We found that we could really map out how this tissue is growing inside zebrafish and how it could be growing inside many different species. This is an animal, I showed you that last slide where there are individual, uh, what I refer to as individual cardiomyocytes, heart muscle cells labeled with, um, uh, 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 with, with unique colors. This is a much lower magnification view of a juvenile animal. And we see that um, these represent patches of 50 to 100 cells each. And we see that the wall of the heart, just like we have a cardiac wall, is made up uh, in the zebrafish of, of about 60 patches of heart muscle cells. Each of these are derived from just one cardiomyocyte in that uh, developing embryo that initial stage of this last slide that I showed you. Oops. So each of these gives rise to patches of about 50 to 100 cardiomyocytes that build the wall of the juvenile heart. And those cells that are related and come from uh, uh, that same one cell stay together like a pack to form these patches. They generally don't mix in and distribute together. And so, um, what we can learn from this is, is something uh, very high resolution for developmental biology, and that is we know that the wall of, of the fish heart <laughs> is built by uh, about 50 or 60 cardiomyocytes uh, in the embryo, dividing and then staying together uh, as, um, as families of cardiomyocytes. Now, Excuse as, me. Yes. Do, do you know how long the average zebrafish lives? Yes. <laughs> um, so they, they, I don't know about your average superfish because these animals are, um, are, are native to East India, Bangladesh, and in the, probably the dirtiest of rivers there. So they're tough fish, and this is why, we, uh, why they've been incorporated into the laboratories, because they're very tough. Um, in a lab, they can live about five years. So this is more than a laboratory mouse, for instance, by a few years. If you look at other <coughs> fish species of the similar weight you know, from the same area, do these survive longer because of this unique regenerative ability? Yes. Well, you're, you're bringing up an important uh, a correlation, uh, an idea that, that the ability to uh, uh, regenerate, or the generally that regenerative capacity is uh, a, a, a function, or, or maybe it might even control aging and lifespan. And generally, that, that is an idea in the field that's, that's well supported, that, um, that at least, uh, I'll say that the evidence isn't quite there for fish, but for mammals, um, the ability to regenerate skeletal muscle, to replenish blood, for um, neural stem cells to generate more neurons, um, this goes down with aging. And so many people think that aging and age-related age disease is directly dependent on regener regeneration and a gradual loss in, in our own regenerative capacity as, as we age. And so that's, that's why another great reason to study regeneration, a regeneration after an injury, because it, it would get at uh, many of those same mechanisms for just maintaining uh, our, our, our turnover. Yes. How many um, cell wall? How many? What's the cell? Uh, how many cells are in the in a heart cell wall? I mean, is it five or ten or? And are the are the interior ones any different than the exterior ones? Yeah, that, that's a great question, and you you've got the answer right. Five to ten. That's <laughs> 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 true. So um, a fish a fish heart is about five to ten cardiomyocytes thick. At this stage, though, this is a juvenile stage, it's only about one cardiomyocyte thick. Well, it's only one cardiomyocyte thick. And then there are these extensions that I'm not showing inside. It's like, um, they're called trabeculae, but there's, there are these, these elongated muscle fibers that, that go into the lumen. But at this juvenile s stage, the heart is, um, is simple. It has a very thin wall, just one cardiomyocyte thick. But, yeah, I'll get to the next stage in a moment. Yes? 
I was wondering if you cut out the green, which is representative of a cell, you know, by all the green, if you cut that section out, you, you know, you're able to chop off, say, 20% of the heart, would, would green representative cells grow back, or would just like the blue and the purple representative cells take over, and can the heart sustain taking out like all of the same kind of cell? Yeah, that's an interesting question, and one that we can't access uh, currently because this, this imaging can only be done on fixed hearts right now. We're trying to work on ways to visualize the heart in these colors and um, uh, in a live animal so we could do that type of surgery. But I, I would suspect that um, the neighboring cells would proliferate and expand into, um, into that area. And that's, so this, first of all, this color is arbitrary. It's, it's generated randomly at the embryonic stage. So um, uh, green, green doesn't, so each animal will have a different pattern. Mm -hmm. and a different pattern of colors, different shapes and sizes if we do different experimental animals. Um, but um, also, um, yes, I think that, that was fine. Did I, did I answer your question? I think so, yeah. yeah. Um, so by being able to label cardiomyocytes and trace them from this six-week-old stage back into the embryo and, and determine retrospectively, so looking back, what happened, um, it's a very powerful technique, and we didn't mean to be studying this, but we were uh, really surprised when we saw this, uh, this appearance of the wall of the heart at the adult stage of zebrafish. I think maybe you can tell here that it looks different from this younger heart, and now there are only one, two, three, four colors on the, on the uh, represented. <coughs> This is, uh, this is not shown to scale, this is much larger than this. And these are many thousands of heart muscle cells. And you can notice in, in each of these patches, um, you can notice there are many fewer colors. And we can, again, trace this back just to one heart muscle cell in the embryo. And this is really a striking finding. Again, that what we attended the study, which was regeneration. But what we see here, what this tells us, is that for this whole outer wall of the adult heart, which then becomes five to 10 cardiomyocytes thick, uh, only a very small number, a handful, six or eight heart muscle cells in the embryo are, are set aside to, to build that heart muscle. And again, the, what we expected and what the field expects for building the heart is, is uh, a much simpler, uh, uh, mechanism where um, cardiomyocytes are not uh, set aside or have such major contributions. This cardiomyocyte makes more than half of the entire wall of muscle. No one expects that. Uh, is, it would be a, 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 a simpler uh, mechanism if, if many cardiomyocytes were dividing and producing the same. So what we hope to find for regeneration, uh, I'll finish one thought with it, was a dominant cardiomyocyte. We didn't find that. But um, what we found for development was uh, especially dominant cardiomyocytes that uh, are set aside somehow, and I'll show you how, um, uh, to, to give rise to the majority of the wall of muscle. Yes? Um, because the environment is slightly different, uh, internal, external parts of the heart, is it possible that those cells, just by nature of being on the outside surface of the cell, did all the development for the outside, the, you know, the, the inside lining cells, shall we say, um, just naturally because of the environment went that direction. I, I think you're right on to how it's working. I'll, t I'll tell you how it's working. So um, we, we can look at intermediate stages as well as a, a number of experiments that I won't, won't describe that kind of uh, limit the labeling a bit to, to clear the background. And what we can find is that at intermediate stages, also if we section through the hearts, you can see this is animals two months old in between those last stages. This is a large, we call it a clown, but it's a related, all related to one initial cardiomyocyte in the embryo. 
And this is emerging uh, here. And you can see it kind of looks like it's creeping down on the surface. This is a green clown of cardiomyocytes overlapping a red clown. What, what happens is that at only a small number of points on the heart, these inner cardiomyocytes actually break through. They get to the outside. And it's there that they have this real estate to expand. And that's what they do. They grow until they meet the progeny of another clown. So that sounds, uh, that I, I don't know how that sounds to you, but it's, <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't what we expected at all. That there'd be these kind of jailbreak heart muscle cells that get to the outside and start taking up real estate. And uh, I've, I've left out some details, but that's, that's the model. And um, it's something that was, uh, that was striking to us. And I, I think uh, we still haven't been able to, and, and other people who work primarily with, with, uh, with mouse model systems, which is the dominant mammalian system, haven't been able to generate this type of color labeling technology in, in, that, in this species, very important species. Um, but so we don't know to what extent this mechanism is, is something that occurs in, in, uh, in humans, for example, or in mammals. Uh, it might not. But um, in any case, uh, it, was, it was interesting to, to, and surprising to find this. And again, I just want to, this is just a cartoon summary. Muscle cells from the inside, which might be restricted more, can break through a, a thin layer of muscle Make, find their way to the outside, and then they start expanding. Something really interesting that we didn't expect to find about how the heart develops. Yes? If you get different zebra fish, do the same cell types or clones appear on the surface, or are they different? Well, each, each zebra fish heart looks, looks very different. A different pattern of these. And, and there may be a tiny, mm. tiny clone here, Big one over here. There may be um, a heart with 20 clones. We think it's stochastic, or it's 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 a random process where it's not really determined which heart muscle cells are going to get out there. So it'll be different in every animal. Um, and I should say that while these muscle cells are are doing this kind of dynamic activity, the heart's still contracting, and they're presumably still involved in. The, the major function or the, uh, uh, the the primary function of the heart, which is to contract. So, um, um, and how they fulfill both those functions: proliferation on the surface, division on the surface, and contraction. Or whether whether they're taking a break from contraction during this is not not especially clear yet. Yes. Have you been able to identify? Are they pre-programmed? Even though they're individual hearts, just like we all have individual hearts, can you figure out? Which ones are they pre-programmed from the hater side to come out? Yeah, that, that's a great, great question. And that, that is the next important question. What, what I can tell you is that this area here, um, right at, always at the, this is the base of the ventricle, this is the apex. Always at the base do we see this first clone. So stereotypically, it's, it's always there. And there's a point of emergence there. Everything else is, 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 is more or less random and different in each animal. So we've postulated that there may be some, um, that there may be some program uh, or some, uh, some uh, 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 consistent, uh, consistency or some determination there. But we haven't, haven't find that, found that yet for, for that site. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yes, uh, please, first. Do you have any idea how any of the mechanical signals that occur in the heart because it's a beating, yeah. stressed, strained construct? And whether the strains are higher, maybe, at the base? Yeah, yeah, no, that's that's perfect. So whatever cell, yeah. you know, they're all the same cells that get to the surface, and those ones that get to feel that. That's the leading uh, model, yes, yes. So, so we think that, uh, and we have some evidence to say that as the, the heart's growing, it has only this single cardiomyocyte thick layer, but the fish is growing, and at some point it needs to thicken that to increase cardiac output. 
And you can see um, indicators of stress, of stress on the heart, at about that stage before it happens. So we have a, a lot of, of indirect lines of evidence that, that make us think that it is the strain on the heart that leads to these kind of breaches and, and uh, allows that muscle to escape from, from the outside. That is the model we have. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, one, of, one of the things that I find most puzzling is the coordination uh, of all of this. And I'm wondering if uh, with the cells coming out, you've got now a matrix on which to build, and that might be a way in which it's directly and directionally uh, important to develop that. Yeah, yeah, so the, the muscle cells making the, the matrix as they, as they emerge, or? But in a coordinated manner. You, you talk about the cells that come out to the surface, and then they uh, develop, and then that process continues. And that's one way to keep the, the process going, to keep, keep it uh, directed. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, to, to build the... Build what the happens if you power. change the outer matrix? What happens then? <coughs> During this process, yeah. we haven't. We haven't looked at it. Clearly something, so this um, type of imaging just shows the muscle, but there are other layers of the heart that are not fluorescent, including one that we study called the epicardium that is, seals the whole heart. It's like a, 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 an epithelium or a, an envelope. And so we think that, uh, and it, it's already known that that makes some of these matrix components you might be referring to. We actually <coughs> the epicardium, the cell type I mentioned. So muscle is myocardium, epicardium is the furthest on the outside. We think this is uh, helping also to, to stimulate the, these events and maybe guide that, but we don't have the evidence you asked for uh, in terms of uh, manipulating. Mm -hmm. Yes? Is there an electrical system going on that is, is directing any of this? Yeah, that's, that's interesting. And, um, uh, I, we don't know, but there are, are um, there are now great ways you can uh, look at voltage changes and calcium changes, and we haven't uh, uh, in in real time. It, it also, using fluorescent dyes that might fluoresce when there's a, a change in uh, either the memory potential or the amount of calcium which is uh, in the cells, which is important for contraction. So um, we um, we're setting up to to visualize and see if there's anything interesting there, but, but I don't know. Most of my answers will be, I, did, I don't know, but <laughs> <laughs> questions have been very good. Um, yes? Um, do you study generations of fish? Are there any genetic things going on with this? Yeah, yeah um, we, we, we generally apply genetics <laughs> to the um, to, to regeneration events. What's, what's great about this fish, and why we use zebrafish versus almost any other fish, there's only one or two others, is that, is that you, can, you can do genetic analysis really well. You can make mutants, for instance mutants, um, in a random way and then perform a screen, screening for those mutants that affect a process like heart regeneration or fin regeneration, which I'll, I'll show if, 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 uh, if, there's, if there's time for it. And, uh, um, uh, but for this, we, we haven't applied genetics yet to it. These transgenes, so these are transgenes with all these colors, that's, that's applying uh, molecular genetics to it. There are, in fact, two artificially engineered transgenes in, that, in this system that allow us to, to generate these colors. That's really straightforward in, in zebrafish to, to, to make transgenic animals or mutant animals. So, oh, how are we on timing? Sure. Okay. So, I, I wanted to get at a question maybe some of you were thinking about, um, uh, at least for the biology of it. Uh, I think um, one of the most fascinating questions is why we don't regenerate as well as some, as, as a zebrafish. And m most people in the field agree that uh, regenerative capacity uh, is different among. Uh, many vertebrate species and invertebrate species as well, that, that it's not uh, the case where all these different species have, get, have gained them uh, and are, have become special, but instead uh, mammals and, and many other um, 
uh, uh, species have over over evolution lost regenerative capacity. So common ancestors, common very simply, common ancestors can regenerate well, and then uh, many of our tissues have lost uh, this this ability somehow, some way. But how does that happen? Um, we, we, we don't have answers for this. It's very difficult to definitively answer questions about evolution, um, uh, other than that, of course, half of mine. Um, <laughs> but, um, uh, the, um, the case of, of, uh, of heart regeneration is interesting. It's an extreme where animals like salamanders, which we find in, in large amounts in our backyard in North Carolina, and humans have a, a uh, an incredibly different ability to regenerate a tissue like the heart after a very extreme injury. So for this question, I just wanted to again go through something I don't normally talk about. Um, a story about fin regeneration. Fin regeneration is, is my favorite regenerating tissue. This is a video made by Foot and Mary Lynn in his lab. And it, it shows you that over a period of two weeks, ten days or so after a complex amputation of the tail fin, you get a, a really nice um, coordinated restoration of structures. These are also complex with bone, nerves, blood vessels, connective tissue, uh, epidermis, pigmentation. It all comes back. It needs another couple days here, but uh, it will come back. Um, something we've found, and again, our, our program in fin regeneration is, is to find out factors that are important for it using genetics. And, and then to see how those factors are uh, regulated in, say, animals that can't regenerate as well. So that's the ultimate goal. But really, we just follow whatever, whatever, wherever the research takes us, because I think that's how we can have the biggest contribution uh, to the field and to that ultimate goal. And what we had uh, noticed several years ago, many people, many students, asked the question of, uh, do do males and females of certain species regenerate similarly? Is any, any, is any sex better than the other? In zebrafish, the, the, the women are better. It's, it's, it's amazing that we didn't know this until just a few years ago. But, but a student of mine was amputating all of the fins. They have seven fins. And the pectoral fins, the forelimb equivalents, uh, in males, it turns out, don't regenerate nearly as well as females. If you amputate, so regeneration will go from bottom to top. If you amputate a fin, pectoral fin of a female, they regenerate perfectly well in about two weeks, and any of the other fins. Male fins regenerate great, except for these pectoral fins, which, um, which don't regenerate well. I, I hope you can see these kind of have these, these defects, these deformed fins. So a very, very different topic than what we were just talking about. But we were interested in this and surprised that we'd never noticed this in the field and never reported something like this. And so, uh, I won't go through some of this stuff, but what we were then able to do was some biochemistry to look for, in an in a unbiased way, what factors might be there in the female that are allowing regeneration in these female fins and maybe not there in the male, or, or uh, what factors might, be, might, might there be in the male, the male fins that are inhibiting regeneration. And that those inhibitors might not be there in the female. And you can use many techniques now to screen really every gene in the genome of a, a fish to get a bunch of candidates. And we found one candidate, which is a, uh, a factor that's secreted from cells, it's produced and secreted out of cells. That blocks a very famous uh, signaling pathway mediated by a, uh, a, a factor called WINTS. So this is a series of signaling that occurs inside cells that generally, I'm, I'm, going, to, I'm going, to, going to just generalize, but it generally helps cells proliferate, uh, stay alive, and uh, to, to make more of a tissue. So, so WINTS are commonly uh, important for growth of, of tissue and development of structures. And many of the important discoveries about WINTS were made in fruit flies. Again, saying how important it is to, to study these very basic uh, systems. 
what we had uh, then set out to do is to visualize that inhibitor and to see if making, using fluorescent proteins again, this time just a standard green, to visualize how this product is made, where it's made, what cells make it. And you can do that through making a transgenic animal with the uh, DNA sequence that's upstream of this gene driving a fluorescent reporter. Standard techniques in the lab. And what we found was that this reporter was uh, expressed and fluoresced in a constellation of signals uh, all over the body of the male. And it wasn't there in the female. I don't know if you can see these dots here, but they're generally expressed in these spiked structures that have been largely ignored uh, in the zebrafish field, but, but are all over the body and not there in females. These are other, other domains here. I'm talking about these very fine spikes. You can see those. And we didn't expect we'd be headed in this direction, but we found that these spikes are especially prominent on the pectoral fins of males. Here are these rows of thousands of them. And on females, they don't have any of these. Again, not something we expected and wasn't there in the literature. Here's another image. If you take a tissue section through these spikes, there's uh, a, uh, you can see how, how they look. And this green represents cells expressing this inhibitor. Now remember, this is an inhibitor of a very important pathway for tissue growth and some context of tissue regeneration. And only the males produce it. So um, this led us to uh, another direction. And ultimately, I'll get back to regeneration. But breeding. And um, because it's a male-specific structure, because we found we could add essentially testosterone to females, and they would start producing the same uh, structures there with that same inhibitor, we figured it had something to do with the process uh, of breeding and generally of maleness. And in fact, in zebrafish, in the field, there are hundreds of labs setting up tanks like these, where you ask them to breed overnight. You put a male and a female together, uh, or sometimes a male and two females, if he's lucky, and um, some plants for atmosphere. And uh, what, what you see here, what you see here separates the fish from the space on the bottom. And these fish will uh, spend the night together in the morning, they'll breed, and there'll be maybe 200 fertilized embryos underneath. But you can't really see much going on, and, and many of us never thought about how fish breed. But um, I won't show you everything here, but we started looking more <laughs> at the breeding of zebrafish, just following where the data were taking us. And this is a, a um, video that I hope shows. This is a video. We, what we found was that the male would take its pectoral fin and put it right under the female. These are very short videos because um, they take up a lot of, of space. Uh, it's, it's such high speed. Normally, you, you, you can't detect any of this. But here's the male. He swims around, tries to corner the female, takes its pectoral fin on the side with those spikes and starts pushing against the female. At that point, you see eggs released, and their sperm released also. I don't know if you came to this talk expecting to see this. <laughs> but this, this got us excited. At, at, uh, <laughs> that, that's um, for, um, for a couple of reasons. One is, and I'm closing with the last couple of slides here, one was what we accidentally uh, stumbled into figuring out how fish breed. If we, if we amputate the fins of males and then ask them to breed, they simply can't. And if they, we pull off these spikes and have the males uh, uh, try to breed with the females, they, they can't. They absolutely need those spikes to be able to breed. And we think they, they use them to kind of either latch on to the female uh, or to stimulate them in some way. Um, but they are, are, are there in all laboratory strains of zebrafish. Now, very interestingly, for some reason, they also synthesized this potent inhibitor of regeneration. And in fact, 
The reason that males can't regenerate, we know through some experiments I won't describe, is that by amputating through that field of all those structures on the fin, you actually amputate in a region, or ask regeneration to occur in a region where there's all this inhibitor. And so that inhibitor that's being made actually interferes with uh, the ability to regenerate. It blocks regeneration. And so I don't know if you can see what I'm setting up here, but what we propose based on this is that these structures on the male, which are absolutely essential for them to mate, and not all fish breed in this way, this is actually kind of unusual that they use these fins in that way, and it's, it's the males that, that initiate like that. They absolutely need those structures. They need them making that inhibitor for them to function and for them to be continually produced. And that is a more important uh, trait than the ability to regenerate. And that makes sense, because if you can't breed, there's no point in, in, in needing to regenerate. Um, this is the absolute trait you need to have. And so um, this sets up a, a model where we think it's, it's one way by which regeneration may have been lost in contexts like our heart or in contexts like our spinal cord or, or various contexts. Not the only way. And it's possible that uh, it's, it's, it's only very isolated to the system. But at least in the context of male zebrafish fin regeneration, what we think we're seeing is a product of evolution where breeding and the ability and the importance of keeping these structures has taken a, a larger role and actually started to weed out the process of, of regeneration. And that producing these inhibitors is more important um, for breeding than it is for allowing that pathway to mediate regeneration. I, I hope I explained that, that okay. And so we think this is a possible explanation for other instances where regenerative capacity has been lost. That is, tissue is complex. It's generally a series of using a small number of activators and a small number of inhibitors in strategic ways. And there can be interference and unwanted crosstalk where you put an inhibitor where, in a place where it could block an event like regeneration. It's speculative, but our, our, I think it's a, a, uh, an interesting idea. And I just wanted to describe this because it's, it's where our, uh, our experiments attempting to investigate regeneration in a broad way to understand how it happens, hopefully to have that work, somehow stimulate the ideas for uh, 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 regenerative therapies, uh, has, has gone towards understanding basic biology and basic questions about regeneration. Thank you. That's all I have. Yeah. <laughs>